what is up you guys Tristan here Ingram Orchids and more I apologize about the noise the neighbors are having their mowing service they're uh, they're there at their house today and this is the only time I have to uh, film this video so I apologize about that but recently I made a short uh, talking about rhizoctonia which is a fungal infection and I had a certain catlia that I noticed I had an active infection of rhizoctonia and today I would like to do just do a little bit of a video going over what I'm doing with the plant, how I'm treating the plant, and how you should handle this. So rhizoctonia is a root and stem uh, disease. It usually infects, I notice it more in cattleyas and dendrobiums, um, but it can affect other plants as well. Um, it usually infects plants that are, have been in an organic mix that you know has become really old and mushy, uh, heat stress plants, plants that have been on their mounts for too many years, uh, it doesn't have to be, it can happen at any time, but these are the risk factors that, you know, increase your chances of uh, the plant contracting it. Certain varieties of plants are just very prone to it. I've noticed uh, big standard cattleyas, uh, the big flowered stuff, they just seem to be really prone to rhizoctonia infection for whatever reason. Uh, but that being said, like I said, old mix, uh, if it's in something organic that has like bark or charcoal in it that gets really, really old and yucky, uh, that's a haven for uh, rhizoc. If you have old root systems, they start to decay. I think rhizoctonia may be one of those opportunistic parasites that you know can feed on dead material, but as soon as it sees an opportunity to infect living tissues, it, it goes ahead and infects the tissues. And I want to show you what I've done so far. One of my favorite standard white cattleyas. This is Tida Eagle Eye White Angel FCC AOS. So this being an FCC plant is the only reason I'm mucking around with it. Uh, an FCC, if many of you know, the American Orchid Society, that's the highest award quality you can get for a flower. Um, this plant here I know is prone to it. I've seen rhizoctonia in this selection of cattleya before. This is not the first time I've noticed rhizoctonia pop up in this plant. And that being said, I had it in a six inch pot and the mix was pretty old and I should have seen this coming and I should have dealt with it a little bit sooner. So I've gone ahead and cut up the plant and made a nice incision with sterilized, torch sterilized clippers. And I will do that here in a second because I want to show you all something. But I have sterilized my clippers, made a nice cut here, got all the infected woody growth out of there. There might be a little bit of the rhizome that's a little bit brown there. Uh, but if I cut any more of that away, uh, I risk just losing the plant entirely. And that's another thing I want to talk about. There's, if I don't, if you don't get it all out, you really, really run the chance of getting, uh, just losing the plant entirely because it tends to come back even with a really good fungicide treatment. So here we have the other side of the growth that was also affected. So we have our newest growth, the previous bulb, and then the previous bulb. And if you'll notice, one of the telltale signs for rhizoctonia is you get this very woody looking growth that spreads up the bulb from the bottom and that's usually where you start to realize that you already have an infection but by that time it's already into the plant tissues and I want to show y'all here I have this green twisty tie on there I should get that off I'll just move it up so y'all can see it at the base of this bulb come on focus at the base of this bulb here, we have that brown woody growth or woody tissue that's starting to protrude up the bulb. So unfortunately, this is going to have to be cut out. Otherwise, it will just return. And usually I would not muck around with a two bulb piece. A single developed bulb with a new growth to me is usually not worth it. I usually, if it's, if it's this far advanced into the newer tissues, I usually just chuck it and say whatever because a one bulb piece of cattleya with just a new growth tends to take a long time to recover. Whereas other over here, we have at least three bulbs. So this one has a much higher chance of doing well after the treatment. This one I would usually just cut. But like I said, this plant has an FCC. It's a really, really nice cattleya. Uh, Tide Eagle Eye uh, White Angel is a beautiful, beautiful white cattleya. So in this case, I am going to make an incision and try to uh, save a one bulb piece. I wouldn't normally do this, like I said, if it wasn't special, we would just bin it, it'd be in the trash, and we'd forget about it. But, 
That being said, some other people also want to talk about Fusarium. Fusarium and Rhizoctonia, I have noticed, tend to go hand in hand. I usually notice Rhizoc and Fusarium together in the same plant. Not always, but they can happen. Right here we have just classic Rhizoc, dead rotten roots, no real signs of Fusarium. But in one of the bulbs as I was investigating, I did notice a little bit of the telltale bright purple margins associated with Rhizoctonia oxysporum. Y'all can see these old bulbs. See that, that's just that characteristic brown woody growth. And is this the one? Yes, it is. I hope y'all can see that. Maybe I should put this up against the, uh, the table here. Maybe that'll make it stand out a little bit better. Um, with the GoPro, it's really hard to get something close up to focus. But there is a little bit of that purple, and this is a really old bulb. You'll notice Fusarium and Rhizoc, they tend to start in the oldest tissues of the plant and work their way up, uh, sometimes gradually, sometimes quickly. Here, maybe y'all can see that. There's a little bit of purple, maybe suggesting a little bit of a Fusarium infection, uh, but I don't think that's the main culprit. That's probably a secondary infection. My guess is the Rhizoc got a hold of this plant first. Fusarium being very common in the environment just made its way in here. Um, and so both of the chemicals that I'm using today are effective and listed for Fusarium and Rhizoctonia. So that shouldn't be as big of a deal. And that being said, I am going to be dipping these into some very nice fungicides here. And I get a lot of questions, or me and Catherine both get a lot of questions often about what chemicals we recommend. And one of my favorites here is Heritage. Heritage recently came out with a, uh, a homeowner special here. You don't have to buy their $400 bottle of, uh, of the commercial size product anymore. Now you can buy this, uh, I think it's like 40 bucks or so. But Heritage is a strobulin, and the active ingredient here is azoxystrobin. And azoxystrobin, like I said, is a strobulin. I really like the strobulins um, because most of them are systemic. They are derived from uh, a naturally occurring uh, chemical that was isolated from other species of fungi. And uh, the fungi that these were found in, the, the strobulins were found in, um, are a natural fungicide produced by uh, a species of fungus that you know kills off competing fungi and a lot of them are very, very effective. They're very broad spectrum, which means they cover a very wide variety of fungi. Um, and like I said, they're, they're pretty powerful. Uh, azoxystrobin is only locally systemic, so it does not move up and down the tissues very much, but it just stays in the tissues where it makes immediate contact with. So keep that in mind. Uh, systemic, broad spectrum, does not move up and down the tissues very well, so only locally systemic and the other one that I use not a lot of orchid growers use this and I don't know why um, you can burn your plants with this if you get a little over a uh, little heavy-handed with this maybe that's why others don't use it uh, but this is Eagle and Eagle's ma active ingredient is Michael Butanil you can find this in the garden section under uh, I think a spectricide fungicide brand I think has the same ingredients I might be wrong so Double check me on that. But Michelobutanil, that's another really great systemic fungicide. It stays in the plant tissues for a while. And Eagle's not especially great at uh, treating uh, Fusarium. Uh, it does list Fusarium on the label, I believe. But Eagle is really good for Rhizoctonia, for whatever reason. It, it seems to be quite effective at treating Rhizoctonia. And Heritage, like I said, is very broad spectrum. It does... Um, it is effective against hair, or Fusarium and Rhizoctonia both, and quite a lot of other uh, disease-causing fungi. And that being said, I have mixed up a couple gallons here. Um, both of the fungicides are in solution here. I added a little bit of Dawn dish up it added as a surfactant. So the next thing we're gonna do is I wanna show you, I'm gonna just cut out this bulb here. It will be a sad little growth, but we gotta do it. So I'm gonna let y'all let y'all see that. So I don't know if y'all are going to be able to see me or not. So we have our clippers here. And our blow torch. I've already sterilized it a few minutes ago, but uh, it's not hot anymore. So we're going to go ahead and just get it hot again.
One of the reasons we like hot tools is not only because you're sterilizing your equipment, but as you get it really hot, you're adding that, um, you know, that instant steam effect. You're cauterizing the wound a little bit as you cut. So as y'all can see here, Rhizox in this uh, third bowl. We got that out of there. And if I were to have to make another cut, just to note, we would sterilize again. Let's say I had not gotten all the affected tissue out of there. We would torch our tools once again. So even though they're hot, uh, we still want to make sure any living material that's on our clippers is dead before we make another incision into living tissues. So I don't know if y'all are going to be able to see that. But we have nice, healthy, green, unaffected tissues here. Um, and the icing on the cake is going to be the fungicide treatment because otherwise the spores are all around on this plant and it's likely to just come back. So we have our nice fungicide, our heritage, and our eagle mixed up and y'all will notice that I'm using gloves. Neither one of these chemicals is extremely toxic. Um, heritage, uh, zoxystrobin does not have a very high mammalian toxicity, uh, but mycobutanil is a little bit more questionable, not the greatest for you. Uh, and we always want to just minimize exposure. We don't want to overexpose ourselves to any chemicals that we don't have to. Uh, any pesticides, I should say. Um, better terminology there. We don't want to overexpose ourselves, so we're using gloves. We always want to be careful when we have to be. So I'm going to uh, let these soak here for probably 10, 10 minutes or so. Uh, you don't have to let them soak for that long. Um, and that being said, uh, once I've soaked some plants that are diseased in this uh, fungicide use, uh, I'm not going to continue just soaking. Once I've soaked plants, I'm not going to use this solution and go spray my other plants with it. I'm dipping plants that are affected, and then I'll probably find something in the yard, some plant that looks like it's uh, needs some fungicide, something that's in the ground planted, and just dump it on there. We're not going to dump our excess pesticides down the sink. That would be a big no-no. We'll find a plant in the yard that looks like it could use some uh, disease help and we'll find and we'll dump it there. So. All right, we're back guys. Uh, we're gonna let our plants sit here for a little, few, little while. So we have our plants that we're soaking in our uh, heritage and eagle solution here. Drip all that off of there. Trying to get it all over the place. And I said that we would be back and show the end results. Um, what we may end up coming and doing is trimming off some of these other roots. Um, anything that looks brown, because most of that's going to die anyways. We're going to try and keep some of the good roots in there. Uh, and I actually realize now that I'm out of potting mix. Sometimes if it's not a severe problem, I will, you know, soak them in their fungicide and then just pot them right away. Um, what would be better advice it'd be to do what i'm going to have to do now is to let them sit dry bare root for a couple days um just to keep them on the drier side because you know our fungicide is doing its work but we don't want to just keep continuous moisture around uh, the newly stressed plant uh, that's just also another recipe for fungus and we would like to minimize um, any entry points so what we'll have to do is just leave these dry for a day or two and then come back and repot them as needed. Uh, so that's all I have for you today, to guys. Um, I luckily have not seen any other plants right now that have active infections or nothing that looks too concerning at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to show you all that since I had to deal with it. Um, I thought I would show you all what I was doing. And somebody is going to ask undoubtedly in the comment section, what the rate is for these two chemicals. And I usually don't like to, um, you know, just say the rates just out loud, just because in case I were to be wrong, uh, you know, I make mistakes sometimes. Uh, I would hate, I would feel really guilty if somebody started using the wrong rates on these. So what I will say is read the label. And I know that sounds repetitive. I say that all the time, but you, you should. If you were gonna be using any of these pesticides, uh, you, um, you know, you have a responsibility to read the label in its entirety and uh, understand what it is you're using. Uh, there's going to be some uh, rates on here that may be a little confusing. You may be seeing per thousand gallons or something like that or per acre. Um, but if you're ever in doubt, um, you can always ask someone who's been using the product. I believe this is, uh, I use for two gallons, I used one and a half teaspoons. And for this heritage, I use half a teaspoon per gallon. Uh, but like I said, I could be wrong. 
I'm just going off of memory. So read the label and make sure that you are getting the correct rates there. Uh, you do not want to use the wrong rate. You don't want to overdo it because you can burn some of these chemicals. You can burn your plants by using too much and too much of a good thing is a bad thing. And you also don't want to use too little. I see some people will use like half a teaspoon on chemicals. I know that the rate calls for a teaspoon. And what you're running the risk of there is if you don't have enough active ingredient in your solution, um, what you run the risk of is kind of like antibiotics. You're not providing enough chemical to, you know, uh, provide a complete control uh, of the pathogen. And anything that hangs around after you've used a low dose is going to be possibly more resistant to the chemical. And that's how you breed uh, superbugs that, you know, are resistant to all sorts of systemic fungicides. So you don't want to use too little. You don't want to use too much. You want to use the amount that the, um, the manufacturer has undoubtedly spent years and years testing. And they know what the correct amount of their product is to be safe and effective. So just read the label. And I know that sounds a little preachy, guys. But that's, uh, that's the responsible thing to do. Uh, not to say that I always you know, do everything right. I don't always do everything right, but uh, you just want to be careful with the chemicals that you use. Use them in a correct and safe manner. And that being said, guys, that's all I got for you today. So we'll see you on the next video. And hopefully you don't see too much of what you just saw in this video. Hopefully you don't have any problems with the Rhizoctonia, Fusarium, or any other disease causing agents around your orchids. Uh, so we'll see you in the next video, guys. Thanks.